Welcome back to series three, I think. It is. Of Finding the Others. Um, I want to start, I've had loads of questions that I've been dying same, to ask. Yeah. Same. <laughs> but we started, uh, we, we met in the in the waiting room there a minute ago and we didn't allow ourselves to speak and I had to actually close my mouth to stop it because I have so many things. But I'm going to start first. I think our best conversations have happened pre-podcast. Yeah, yeah That's absolutely. The yeah. We gagged ourselves. So... <laughs> We haven't seen each other in a while. You've been you did some amazing traveling. You went to the States, I think, for Canada, Canada yeah. for Northern America. Yeah. Uh, North America, I should say. And something happened to you in the customs that you haven't told me yet. Oh, have I not told no. you? <laughs> oh my god, right. So I don't know what have I, I do you know my story of being deported as a five year old from Canada? No. No, right. So my me and my family, we traveled to Canada, uh, emigrated to Canada when I was five years of age and long story short and I won't go into the details of it but me few, few, me dad maybe done a few illegal activities and by the time my mum got over there she followed us a couple of months later and um, because she was having me brother James we were getting deported from Canada with a police escort on an airplane no yeah, what age yeah. were you I was six coming back it was my birthday on the plane so I, I often say what's called I, I remember it was like having a, like a, as a six year old you want cowboys and Indians and policemen yeah. so I had a policeman on the airplane for me for my birthday party going home I had good memories my mum and dad I'd say didn't but <laughs> we ended up in the Ballymun Flats obviously a very bad family experience like lost a lot of money over there we'd sold our house to emigrate start a new life didn't go well ended up with nothing in the Ballymun Flats so it wasn't a good experience I suppose part of my own trauma journey but um, I was going back to Canada in 2017 to do a talk in Montreal to make a long story short again I basically got stopped at immigration but my ability my learned ability to create space between an inevitable just putting this on to go and then to, to create space between an inevitable life's inevitable challenges and your reaction to them so the work I've done had helped me to be non-reactive mm. and he let me in illegally let me in because they, they asked me about my story he asked me why are you so happy uh, about getting deported because I was in Montreal at this stage and I says look says I do a lot of work around regulating emotions I wouldn't be walking me talk I was in addiction for years I'm over here to do a big talk an academic conference it's my first one I'm nervous as hell but excited but here if I can't do it I have to accept what I can't control they gave me a free pass on the back of that now that's a miracle that's that's a miracle right now I thought that was all sorted out and I'm going back to Toronto this time to do a talk a keynote talk based on finding space between the challenges a few months ago a few months ago this was two months ago less than two months six weeks ago um, uh, gone over Enterprise Ireland and basically um, I was going to be doing a keynote of how I once got departed from Canada that was part of the talk (laughs) I get to Toronto Airport thinking everything saw it out and he says uh, this real very militant wasn't a nice woman I met in Montreal there's a very militant militant man that uh, felt like he should have been in the army not not in the airport (laughs) immigration and he's saying uh, I'm sorry sir we're going to have to put you in a detention centre. <laughs> this, is, this is at two o'clock in the morning, four hours oh, before my workshop. No. I hadn't slept for 24 hours at this stage. And I start. I, I just, I think it's just a natural response for me. It's a learned behaviour. And I just started laughing. I was saying, this is funny. And he was, sir, you're the happiest person I've ever seen that's going into a detention centre. And I start laughing. I says, look, I'm actually over here to do a <laughs> workshop on my last time getting the port. And he's like, so you admit that? And I'm like, yeah, like, I was just telling him the truth. And he was saying there was nothing he could do until I, t- I says, look, I wrote a book. In my book, it's a, I talk about getting the port from Canada. It's in here. He says, is there any chance that you can... They, do, they let me away with this a few years ago in Montreal. And he looks at me and says... This isn't Quebec, sir. We don't break the law in Toronto. But I ended up taking out my brochure for my resilience workbook. And he looked at it and he says, I'm all about resilience. Let me have a word with my superior. He went off, had a word. Now, he took my passport off me, but he allowed me to stay in Toronto till four o'clock the next day. Was going to be a warrant if I didn't show up the airport. But on the back of not reacting with anger, rage or fear, I, I was out to go in and do the workshop. So it just shows you your emotional reactivity determines the outcomes of your life events. That is unbelievable. There are two miracles in a row because customs people or immigration people are known to be, as you said, quite militant. Especially and, Canadians. Yeah. yeah. And that's ama- But firstly, what strikes me about that is you are actually doing all the things that you teach people and that you practice. And there was the time where you needed it most. And yeah, you did it, 
and the results are actually outstanding. Yeah, I would say the first time in Montreal sort of hardened my belief that this was profound, that your yeah. ability to be non-reactive. And I've really doubled down on the practice. Mm-hmm. And like it was against me in, in Toronto, no sleep, I was hungry. Yeah. And what you call it. And it was just like, what can you do but laugh? What like it's what's inside of your control. I couldn't control anything. Yeah. But when you control what you can control, your response, you broaden what you can control. You can't can't control it, but you can maybe tip it in the right direction. Isn't it back to lots of the other episodes we talked about, this idea of surrendering? Yes. In that moment, I'm sure that immigration person, that officer, sees loads of people lose it. Yeah. either crying or get really angry with them and they you know and they kind of re- reflect that back in their behavior but y- you couldn't do anything you had to accept or surrender to the whole experience and within that then was the power was the power and it, it really is and do, do you know what it, bring, it brings me back we always go back to the ice baths for obvious reasons it's like that it's surrendering in the ice baths and it's because oh, i'm wondering there what gave me that ability to laugh at that. Now, I do think it's part of my own journey. I, I, I genuinely believe I shouldn't have been alive after years of addiction. So I think that's given me a shift. Mm. But again, it's those practices and it's like the ice baths is mm. the practices, the, the challenges of life. When you're non-reactive to challenges on a daily basis, when the big game comes along, yeah. you are more practiced to be able to do that. Yeah, I was teaching a workshop yesterday and <clears throat> we were talking about the metaphorical ice baths that come at you all the time. And there was, that's a big, huge ice bath that came at you there. You know, this thing that could be shocking and chaotic and you feel totally under pressure and unable to do anything. But you had the practices in place and you've been practicing them that when it came, you could deal with it. Yeah. And I'd love to ask you this as well, because it's not, it's not a conscious kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. It's not like, right, I in that moment, I says, right, I need to control what I can control. Mm-hmm. I need to, because that, that, that doesn't really happen because I think when that when a challenge comes in, the stress response kicks in. So it sort of shuts down the brain and yeah. it's a very emotional, reactive kind of a thing. It's reflexive nearly. Um, it, it, the limbic brain kicks in. So I think it's the, it's the pre-practice yeah over time that allows you to just naturally it's a, it's a natural accordance would you yeah. would you agree with that i think because the practices of maybe you know uh, assessing how you've been behaving before self reflection meditation breathing ice baths all those things are i think reprogramming deep in us yeah are our instinct our, yeah. our natural reaction to things so it's not like the person experiences something terrible and thinks oh this is like an ice bath I'm going to do like I do in the ice yeah. bath but it's the practice of maybe getting in the cold shower every morning and learning to deal with that that somewhere in us is reprogramming our reactions all the time so then when it happens our instinct the body is again feeling the cold cold shower or feeling the ice bath or in this case the pressure because they're all pressures they're all pressures that's all it is and it's all it's physical pressures like it's even it, you think pressure. it's a psychological pressure but it's physical you can making feel a psychological it. it's Absolutely. inside it's energetic yeah and then because we've kind of reprogrammed how we react to those pressures it is an instinct like in in, in some situations I've found myself reacting in a way and looking back and going God, that was, you know, how did I react like that? Yeah. You know, how did I say, you know, remain calm or whatever it was and say that thing? Because in that moment, as you said, it's so instantaneous mm. that it's very much not a not a conscious decision. But that's where I think that reprogramming deep in us is happening every time we do it and do it and do it again and again. We talk about how that if a person has a nice warm shower, and they know, okay, I'm going to do a cold shower. And they know all the physical benefits. It helps your immune system, all that kind of stuff. But the deeper benefit is that when you turn it and you build that resi- resilience to it, you yeah. decide to do it and you come out feeling different. It's it, To me, it's like this victory. And it goes into, like, it's, an, it's a victory. No one's around. No one sees it. You're in your own bathroom. But you have learned that you can do something really difficult. Mm. And it might be eight o'clock in the morning. And then your day feels different. Yeah. But if you are doing that consistently and constantly over days and days, even though you might do it every day, but you are learning how to, to find that sense of peace. And then when, as you said, then when the big pressure comes, yeah, 
we have been practicing all the way up to it. Yeah. It's not like we're just somehow miraculously pulling this reaction out of nowhere. It's 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 a learned reaction that becomes, I think, over time, perhaps an instinct then. The instinct is different in us. Yeah, definitely. Do you know what I find really compelling about that as well? Because we, we've talked about that, yeah, 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 we, the metaphor glows, but it's, it's a foundational exercise that sort of generalizes to other life yes. challenges. Yeah. And it's really interesting that even though you have a practice, other practice, let's say exercise can generalize, yep. if you really push yourself, it can generalize to, to other areas as well. And I was able to handle that Canadian event very well. But there's other trigger points in my life that despite the practices, it doesn't generalize as well. And mm. I bring it back, I'm sure everyone's experienced this, whether it's in-laws, whether it's like parents, whether yep. it's... Uh, partners that yep. can just trigger you in a different way and it's like there's another area that is deeply embedded but it's a trigger and it's like they can live with each other like yes. they can really live with each other you can get triggered easily from people I think there is levels to the practice yeah I think the practice starts to I remember I had this great uh, meditation kind of kung fu teacher years ago and he was saying the meditation is like this cup and you start to fill the cup up and eventually it overflows into the other parts of your life. So that kind of calmness you can find in meditation starts to flow, like you're saying, into other parts of your life. Yeah. But it takes a while for that to flow into the deepest parts. Yes. So as a parent, you know, lots of things, of course, would kind of frustrate me or something. But most of them, um, I would I would you know, not worry too much about. But as a parent... Of four mm. children and now four teenagers, they are they are. I keep I say to them, they are like my gurus. They are teaching me the limits of my patience, <laughs> and they, you know, as, as trying to kind of raise them, that pushes me to the point where I do not react calmly, and I say to myself, okay, this is this is where the practice is. This is where I really have to practice this yeah. now. They are giving me the opportunity <laughs> to do this. The biggest, the greatest opportunities. And it reminds you of a, a phrase that you you said, uh, I think it was in the last season, you were talking about how the obstacle doesn't block the way, the obstacle is, is the, the way. way. Yeah, it's a you know, and, I, and, I, and I bring that back into mind sometimes when things are getting very emotional, especially now that the house is full of teenagers and obviously they're pushing back against everything, which is not a natural thing. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the relentlessness of it pushes me to my limit and beyond my limit. But then I try to remember that phrase and say, look, this is this is part of the way. It's not yeah. blocking the way. And it's not going to be perfect. No. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be blowouts. <laughs> and that's just the way it is. That's just the way yeah. it is. So I, I think in that case where your practices came to the front, you know, in that situation in Canada, but sometimes they mightn't come to the front you know, in other, what would seem like maybe more minor situations. Definitely. I think that maybe those, for me, those minor situations are because I really love the person, you know, you know, it, because I have this, it's, they mean so much to me. And I'll add to that as well, because it always comes back to family and the people that you love. And I think there's an element of, I don't even know how true this is, but there's something in it. I think it's the unconditional love that, families have with each other yep. so you can blow out nearly more sometimes knowing that it's not going to break down the yes. relationship and yep. there's something within that uh, I'll give you an example it makes my dad is it, it is not as much but he was a big trigger point for me in terms of uh, he loves to talk about negative politics negative stuff and that was I'd, I'd be more positively <laughs> orientated let's say <laughs> but he had this ability just to trigger me and as soon as something is said I just lose it like it's just a, 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 it was an explosive reaction for me and we'd, we'd go butt heads go back and forth and I remember them. Um, I've practiced that over time, and I've practiced certain so the perspective taken. Like, see it from his perspective. Yeah. He's in the seventies. This is how he's operating in the world. He's a, he's the loveliest man. He's a big cuddly teddy bear, but he just has this little quirk of proneness to negativity. And I was getting him to drive me to a talk up in Sligo uh, there a couple of months back. And I says, right, we're going to have a good time. Don't react if anything happens. And he was a taxi man for years and he just loves to give out about traffic. And it drives everyone in the family insane. Like it's to a level you've never seen. Like, And I says, look, I says, as soon as we got in, I says, no giving out about the traffic. And he starts laughing. He says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and before I turned the key in the ignition, he started giving out, out the neighbour being parked too close to my car. And I could feel it in me, but not the energy, I could feel it. And I start laughing. And he says, you're already giving out. And he starts laughing. And I reversed out of the, out of the garden. This is uh, there in my parents' house. Reversed out. And I sort of reversed out too quick. There was a van coming down the road. Loads of room, no problem. Yeah. But he starts giving out about the van. Look at him coming down. I says, that was actually my fault, if anyone's. And before we left the estate, we got number three given out. And I just, I, I, I could only just laugh. Yeah. But we ended up having an amazing two mm-hmm. hours driving up to Sligo, getting lost, not reacting to that. We did, One of the best times I'd mm-hmm. spent with me dad, in it? like yeah. a good chunk of time. And I was back to that non-reactivity because that could have gone really pear-shaped. Yes, and very early. Very early. But I like what you said there about those relationships are unconditional. Yeah. Like the love is there even though we mightn't feel it all the time, but it's without condition. It's yeah. not the love is there if this. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe that gives us a chance then to to express the frustration at times or to, you know, so let's say with the customs official, there definitely wasn't unconditional love there. No. <laughs> <laughs> so there was loads of conditions in, in, yeah don't conditional yeah. love the law <laughs> <laughs> Toronto law <laughs> but you know and, and, and I think we maybe act differently when it's unconditional because we know there's a load of conditions at play here and we, we have some kind of sense that we have to play or you know our reactions have to be within this the structure of the game yeah yeah Again. Are you going to go back to Canada again? So I'm in the middle of getting me ARC. It's called an authorization to return to Canada because I want to travel. I'm like, thank God, me and Natalie plan to go to Canada on a holiday. Imagine that was like a four four week holiday, big plans, big year holiday. Might have been different. Very <laughs> different. <laughs> Context is key. <laughs> I'm still locked up in Canada <laughs> for <laughs> salt or something. But um, yeah, so it's so the, the challenge I have now because I, I I I'm getting a bit of work over in the states yeah. now as well. In Canada, so I want to go back there. So I have to pay like five hundred dollars, but I have to send me passport to London, wow. which is tricky. And you can't yeah. contact anyone by phone; it's all like through email. And okay. so I don't know what I'm going to do there. We'll see how. So I that would give that. you a chance to go back with, with, without any other hassle or less. Any of the hassle, yeah. And I, I'm guaranteed because it wasn't my fault. And the guy was saying, "Look, it's not your fault. You were five years of age. Like you recognise was yeah. stupid, but you couldn't bend." Yeah. So I'm uh, I'm in the 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 throes of trying to get myself legally back into Canada and if that uh, immigration officer is li- is listening thank you thank you <laughs> <laughs> so do you think then that when, when we're out in society and we are playing more of a game than emotionally because we know that those conditions exist we know there's lots of conditions for interactions with people in shops interactions with people that we work with there is conditional support or you know it, it, it's based on if you do this this happens yeah definitely so um, I, I love the idea of a game as well because it is not a game in a manipulative way but it is a game like it you know is, I mean yeah. you always the different rules of the games different language games like uh, a big fan of Ludwig Wittgenstein mm. he's like the master of language and his second thesis on life is that we're all playing language games like the sport language game I was in the Aviva last night it was like it's a different language you speak the, the podcast game mm. kind of podcast the religion game and there's different rules to different games different contexts to different games as well different conditions to mm. different games of how you react and I think it all comes back down to like the real basic core virtues in life like being compassionate being kind and you don't always get rewarded for that being non-reactive but if you do that on a consistent basis I just think it comes back at you in spades mm. it really does so I don't know what game you'd call it the, the, the human game maybe yeah. you know yeah. but it's just be kind be compassionate and I only I, I'm, re- I'm reading a, a great book at the moment called The Road to Character and it's about virtues. We should probably do it in another podcast about virtues, resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. And it Resume got, as in? Resume, the resume you'd have for like uh, your CV for yes, a job. Yeah. I'm ambitious, I'm yeah, driven yeah. whereas your resume is a little bit different. Of, I, I, your, your eulogy will be kind and yes, compassionate. Of course. And I've started to come up with, with sort of a re- reflective piece for myself in the evening. It's like, what did you do for someone else today? Mm. What kind thing did you do today? And what I find is that sort of pushes you to do it the next day if you didn't find it in that day. Yeah. And I think they're the things that really make you feel good and they make you non-reactive as well. Yeah. Like it really helps you to sort of see the world through a different lens or feel the world through a different lens. And uh, we have we have only two rules in our house. 
as a, as as parents of the children. One of them is to be kind, and the other one is to listen. Yeah, um, or else, they're not always followed. Yeah, you know. But uh, I think that kindness is so important. You know, people often talk about bigger concepts like love or loving yourself, which is which is a much more difficult thing to understand mm. than perhaps being kind to someone. We all can feel what it's like to be kind to somebody yeah. or to be mean to somebody or, or to be mean to ourselves or be yeah. kind to ourselves. I think there are components of this bigger, bigger kind of concept of love. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to teach them. And, and I know you love the the the. Um, where words come from and you know I, I, when we were kind of putting these rules together in the house we were saying that kindness is coming from kin family so you're treating somebody Beautiful. like you're treating them like your family wow um, and I always and I try to keep that in mind you know when I'm going about my business you know how would I treat this person if they were family family I love that I love that do you know what jumps out at me there like is the ripple effect of that like there are two kino habits or virtues like kindness and listen what's been the ripple effect of, of that like well, is there other, other other good stuff like I'm sure lots of good stuff has come into the family uh, as a result you of know, that w w you know the children as they were growing up I was trying to put together something that we could all understand really simply yeah. you know because you might have a rule for don't do this or do that or don't do this or do that but when it came, as they were getting older and they were they're entering the stage of life when they're becoming themselves and they're becoming adults and they're going far afield and they're, you know, they're experimenting with everything, it kind of boiled down to, to, to these two things. And I think when we're having a conversation then, if somebody's in trouble or, um, you know, we might get together as a family and kind of talk about things, we always try and bring everything back to those two rules. So like, mm. you know, if something happens, are you being kind or, or are you being mean, you know, or yeah. are you listening or are you not listening? And it's a reminder for me as the parent as well. Am I listening or am I trying to dominate them to get them to do what I want them to do? Now, my friends, that brings us to the end of this episode, but we shall continue in the next episode.